modern-day Amsterdam is one of Europe's most popular tourist destinations. The largest city in Holland, Amsterdam has long been recognized as perhaps the greatest planned city in Northern Europe. It has grown from the Middle Ages around a series of canals which ring its early boundaries. Elegant mansions from the 17th century line the main canal ring and are spanned by graceful bridges. Excursion boats ply the canals with tourists who may have little idea of the story those bridges can tell. Houseboats of every description also line the canals. Amsterdam is famous for its notion of individual freedom and tolerance, ideals it has fought for for a long time, dating back to its struggles against Spanish domination in the 16th century. It is this true caring, this deep concern for human feelings and justice that make the story of what happened here under German occupation during World War II so compelling. This early global domination of trade and Dutch colonialization initiated contact with people of many lands. And records show that it was about this time that Amsterdam accepted its first Jewish citizen who immigrated from Portugal on March 31st, 1597. He was among the first Sephardic Jews to immigrate from Portugal. Ashkenazi Jews from Eastern Europe arrived later in the 1630s. Holland was a country where Jews could retain their religion and be treated more or less as equals. The massive Portuguese synagogue inaugurated in 1675 stands today as a testament to the prosperity of the 17th century Portuguese Jewish community. Jews initially were restricted to certain trades but were granted full civil equality in 1796. The Portuguese Jews were successful merchants with established business contacts throughout Western Europe, making them useful and respected members of the Amsterdam business and social community. A common characterization of Jews being part of a separate nation with self-administration slowly faded as the Jews became Dutch citizens. With the Nazi invasion of Holland in 1940, it was particularly shocking for these Dutch citizens to be singled out, forced to wear a yellow star, and eventually to be deported. It was equally shocking to non-Jewish Dutch citizens who became actively involved in a widespread resistance movement to hide and protect Jews from the Nazis. One of the best known accounts of these efforts is recorded in the now famous diary of 13-year-old Anne Frank. More than half a million tourists a year visit the very house where the Frank and Van Don families were hidden until their betrayal to the Nazis and their ultimate deaths. Today, the Anne Frank house is among the top 10 tourist attractions in Amsterdam, yet it tells only a very small part of Jewish persecution and Dutch resistance in Amsterdam during occupation by the Germans. What happened to the very soul and psyche of this special city is profound. Memorials, large and small, are all over the city and are carefully tended, each with a special story, each with a special meaning. The early Maranos, or Portuguese Sephardic Jews, settled in an area now known as the Floenberg, near today's Waterloo Square. The original site was an island created to provide more land for Amsterdam's expanding population at the end of the 16th century. The Floenberg offered a good neighborhood as well as a place for Jews to worship. The influx of Ashkenazi Jews in 1648 marked the evolution of a Jewish quarter in this area. Now, while life was hard in the quarter, it never really became a separate ghetto as happened in other European countries. It always remained a mix of Christians and Jews, as well as other faiths and ethnic backgrounds. Anchoring one corner of the area was the Moses and Aaron Catholic Church. The old Floenberg Island eventually was part of the creation of Waterloo Square through the draining and filling of two canals. Street vendors and pushcart merchants had long been part of the neighborhood scene, and two streets called the Broadways marked lively street trade. Jodem Reistrat, or Jewish Broadway, was the center of great activity. Today the area is famous for its huge outdoor flea market, which surrounds City Hall and the modernistic music theater. 
Jewish Broadway is still there, but nothing like pre-World War II days. Some evidence of old walls and gates still exist, but the Nazi slaughter of most of the inhabitants of this area left rows of empty buildings and vacant apartments with owners who would never return. Eventually, most of the old Jewish quarter was torn down and replaced with new buildings. The early markets on Waterloo Square, before the city hall and music theater were built, had a distinct Jewish flavor. Fish, housewares, just about anything one could imagine was for sale. Today's Waterloo Plain Flea Market continues the feel and character of the early crowded market of the 1900s, which was delightfully described in 1926 by Rabbi Dr. Meyer de Hond as being shiny and covered by rust, dainty and dirty, in fine working order and falling apart. Second hand and never been worn before. Crystal and bricks gold-plated this and that, and an imitation you can't tell from the real stuff. Cardboard and real suede, silk and twill, mahogany and mildew, sponge cloth and decay. Here are the philosophers and poets, volumes upon volumes for next to nothing. There, a clean notebook for seven times the price. The variety and flavor characterized by this rabbi with a Dutch name aptly describes the market of earlier years as well as today's market. And the Waterloo Square flea market is a good place to start the story of what happened with the German invasion of Holland. With the surrender to Germany came appointment of not a military but a civilian governor, our Reich Kommissar. He was an Austrian lawyer known for his brutal efficiency in imposing Hitler's ideal of racial purity. His civil government background meant that control of the population would be much easier. Census, birth and tax records made locating Amsterdam's Jews relatively easy. His rule was by military decree. Escape from German scrutiny was almost impossible. Holland is flat with no natural hiding places bounded by open sea to the west and north, German troops to the east, and German-occupied Belgium to the south. The immediate reaction of Amsterdam citizens was to demonstrate and protest anti-Jewish measures. German reaction was swift and ruthless. A famous civil uprising was the dock workers' strike of February 1941 by dockers and transit workers against treatment of Jews. Resistance workers distributed pamphlets shaming those who stood by and did nothing to stop the wholesale Nazi roundup of Jews. Reprisals were swift and brutal and brought a quick halt to overt demonstrations against Nazi civil rule. Three elements are credited with success of anti-Jewish measures in Holland. First was the immediate suppression of public protest and demonstrations. Second was the German ruse of setting up a Jewish council made up of prominent Jewish leaders and professionals who were to act as a communication conduit between the Germans and the Jewish community. In reality, the well-meaning Jewish council became unwitting accomplices in actually delivering the Jewish population to the Germans for immediate deportation and death. The third part of the plan was a gradual implementation of specific anti-Jewish measures, which lulled the whole Dutch population, Jew and Gentile alike, into believing that things weren't going to be too bad, some inconveniences of war, but demands that could be accommodated. Everyone felt that the Germans would lose the war and that it was merely a matter of playing a waiting game. With their long-standing civil rights, most Jews felt themselves Dutch citizens first, just as Catholics or Protestants did. But the following chronology shows how the Nazis' carefully designed plan to murder all Dutch Jews unfolded step by step. May 14, 1940, Holland surrenders to Germany. The Civil Reich Commissar, Dr. Arthur Seisinghardt, is appointed with total authority. Rule is by decree. October 1940, every government official is forced to sign an affidavit that neither he nor any of his family, spouse, or their family are Jewish. November 1940, 
all Jewish Dutch civil service employees are summarily dismissed. January 1941, all Jews living in Holland must register with German authorities. Failure to comply is punishable by imprisonment and confiscation of property. The Jewish Council is formed, made up of 20 members, including rabbis, businessmen, lawyers, and other professionals. February 1941, the Amsterdam Jewish Quarter is established as a ghetto and fenced off after a civil uprising against Dutch Nazi sympathizers near the present-day Waterloo Square. March 1941, Germans began to take over or Aaronize Jewish property. April 1941, the Dutch population is issued German ID cards. July 1941, Jews are required to have a large J stamped on their ID cards. August 1941, Jewish children may no longer attend public schools or trade schools. A wholesale roundup and confiscation of all Jewish savings, assets, and securities is undertaken. Only 250 guilders a month or less is made available to Jewish owners of the confiscated assets. January 1942, forced labor camps for Jews are constructed. May 1942, Jews must wear a yellow star sewn to their clothing with the word Jew on it. All Jews must observe an 8 p.m. to 6 a.m. curfew. Jews may only shop between 3 and 5 p.m. Jews may not have telephones. The German government grants itself authority to seize all Jewish private property except wedding rings and gold teeth. July 1942, wholesale deportation of Jews from Holland begins. Two concentration camps are built in Holland, with Westerbork camp outside of Amsterdam. From here, Jews are shipped to death camps, primarily Auschwitz. September 1943, a final major roundup of 5,000 Jews, including the Jewish Council, are all sent to Westerbork. September 1944, the southern part of Holland is liberated. In May 1945, the remainder of Holland is liberated. To begin to understand why the genocide by the occupying Germans had such a powerful effect upon the citizens of Amsterdam, we should first take a look around the city. A large green area near Waterloo Square is called the Plantage, or Plantation. This lush expanse houses a zoo, botanical garden, planetarium, and an aquarium. It dates from the 17th century. In the 19th century, many middle-class Jews lived here and prospered. Many worked in the diamond cutting and polishing industry. Since the diamond cutting business was relatively new, there was no workers' guild, and Jews were readily able to work. One of the principal streets of the plantation, Plantage Mitilan, our plantation Middle Avenue has not changed much from the days of German occupation. Trolley cars rumble up and down in front of two rather ordinary looking buildings. One is a colorfully painted school. And across the street from it is the Hollandse Schauberg, or Holland Theater. Today, the casual passerby might easily walk right past it but it is a powerful monument and a museum rescued from demolition by private citizens who insisted that it remain as a living reminder of the horrors of genocide. The theater was central to the Nazis' Jewish deportation machine. Whole neighborhoods would be rounded up and made to report to the Holland Theater to await deportation. A school across the street served as a kindergarten, a collection and holding center for infants and toddlers taken from their Jewish parents who were kept under guard in the theater across the street. After nightfall, on the same tracks used by Amsterdam's trolley cars today, adults as well as infants would be quietly loaded up and shipped off for transfer to German trains at the central train station. There. They would be sealed into boxcars and taken to Westerbark concentration camp and ultimately to the gas chambers in Auschwitz. Some adults, as well as children, were smuggled out by brave Dutch resistance members. Others occasionally seized a rare opportunity to escape. And one such escapee was a 12-year-old boy named Jaap, whose mother, father, and 18-year-old brother had already been rounded up and killed. 
Jaap van Velsen is the only member of his family to survive the Nazi reign of terror in Amsterdam. A sister survived the final death march from Auschwitz as the Allies closed in, but she died a few years later. He is a modest, serious man and lives in a quiet area of Amsterdam. He's a scholar, an expert on the history of Holland's Jewish community and the Holocaust in general. After eluding Nazi captors on several occasions, young Jaap was finally rounded up and taken to the Holland Theater for deportation to the death camps. He was about the same age as Anne Frank. He was determined, however, not to be sent to Germany. He convinced a guard that he needed to cross the street to see a cousin in the creche or kindergarten and then seized his moment to escape. Uh, I think from the moment on that I was in the Hollandse Schouwburg, I was thinking how to escape. I saw that every morning at nine o'clock was the garbage car exactly in the middle of the, the road for the Hollandse Schouwburg. And then the officer down was, it was impossible for him to see what was happened to the other side of the street, or other side of the street. And uh, in my child's mind, I th thought, when I go to the other side, and then I walk out, then he can see my, uh, he, he, it is impossible for him, and it was true. I ran maybe for one hour, I don't know where, but I was so tired, I have no clothes. It was very cold. And then I go back to the neighbors of my sister to ask. I don't Jacques van Velsen is modest, house. apologizing for his halting English as he tells of his subsequent year and a half in hiding. He managed to sneak aboard a train at night and hid in the toilets with the doors locked, outwitting guards on the train. And as luck would have it, the train was headed to the south of Holland. He slipped off in Limburg, the southernmost province of Holland, where he was hidden and cared for by a number of families. Today, Jaap is able to return to the Holland Theater, but for a long time, he could not even return to the street where he made his dash to freedom. It was, there was a long time that it was, for, for me, very difficult to pass the Hans Schouwburg. Every time I am thinking what has happened there. But I think that everybody of my age and everybody, they uh, have seen what has happened at that moment. Everybody have the same feelings, I think. There is not one day that I uh, don't think what has happened. For me, and, and I mean it, for me is every, every day war, every day. But at the moment I know to handle it. But Jaap does return to the Holland Theater today and has been instrumental in providing materials and research for the development of the museum inside. It's still difficult for him. And a display of photos on the wall of the staircase is a surviving photo of Jaap in happier times. When he was seven years old, he is seated with his parents. I was six or seven years. That's me. That's my father. And that was my mother. They die. both in Auschwitz. Jaap explains that Amsterdam's Jews, having undergone the progressive stripping away of the civil rights they had enjoyed since 1796, still believed they were only going to Germany for forced labor and would return after Germany's certain defeat. We are living in Holland from 1740 uh, around. And my father, my mother asked my father to go hidden. And he said, it's not necessary. We are Dutch people. And 
in Holland, they don't go in, uh, they, the Germans are not coming in Holland uh, because uh, we, uh, we are not neutral. And he believed that. Even he bring my, my brother, Isaac, he brings the boy, he was 18 years, he bring him to the Hollandse Schouwburg. And he let make a, a, a jacket for him and nice clothes. And it was for maybe a year for to go to a, a work camp. And then the war was over. And then he came back. He believed that, really. Today, the Holland Theater is open free to the public. After standing vacant for years after the war, the building was saved in the 50s. And in 1962, most of the internal structure was removed. An open courtyard remains where the stage and theater seats once served as a final gathering point for Jewish victims. A basalt monument with a base built in the shape of the Star of David stands at the back of the courtyard. A polished wall behind it bears the simple inscription in Dutch and Hebrew in memory of those who were taken away from this place, 1940-1945. Inside, there is a memorial with an eternal flame and illuminated names of those killed in the Nazi death camps. The names from the people, they... from Holland, they, the Nazis killed. Hundred and four thousand. Next to the former kindergarten across the street that once served as a gathering place for infants and toddlers before they were sent to their deaths is a school. When approached, students did not hesitate to tell us that they knew the history of what had once happened in these buildings. Yeah, I know what went on here. They killed all the children. Amsterdam school children are taught an unabridged history of what happened in World War II and particularly to their city. This plaque on the former kindergarten reads, in memory, of all those who helped save Jewish children from deportation during World War II. And the plaque is part of a larger story that is told through many similar memorials in this area of the city. An easy walking tour around the area of the old Jewish quarter could start at Waterloo Square at the flea market. On the Amstel River side, on the pedestrian mall in front of the large music theater, is a stark black column which pays tribute to the Jews who fought in the resistance against the Nazis. And just across from City Hall and the Music Theater is the Walter Suskin Bridge. Walter Suskin was one of the true heroes behind the rescue of Jewish children. A German Jew born of Dutch parents, he is revered today for his courage in hiding records and thwarting German efforts to deport Jews. This bridge near Waterloo Square is a tribute to Suskind, who died in the death camps with his wife and child. Bridges connect all the quarters of Amsterdam in a busy network of urban movement and activity. Many of the city's bridges are living memorials to heroes as well as victims. More than 50 years after the war, neighborhood councils continue to place flowers and wreaths on these memorial bridges. This bridge is named not for a Jew, but for a woman who fought tirelessly for the rights of gypsies, the mentally ill, and homosexuals who were also sent to their deaths by the Nazis. Most tourists who pass under these bridges have no idea that the spans are living memorials. A casual stroll will often reveal very personal, touching mementos like this small hand-picked bouquet wedged next to the name of a Dutch physician and noted resistance fighter, Ben Pollock, for whom the bridge is named. The tiny bouquet tells its own very private story. Continued thanks from someone for Dr. Pollock's courage and leadership.
Just behind the Portuguese synagogue is a large open square. Here, the statue of the dock worker stands as a universal symbol of civil rights and humanity. It has become famous throughout Holland and stands for those Dutch citizens who went on strike February 1941 against Nazi persecution of Dutch Jews. A few days before the famous strike, some 400 Jewish men were herded to the very spot where the statue stands today and were taken away in trucks. Only three of them survived the war. Crossing into the Plantage, we come upon Wertheim Park and a most striking memorial to the victims of Auschwitz. In this quiet, lush green surrounding is a powerful and most unusual monument. Clear glass letters upon a clear glass background form the simple words, never again Auschwitz. Six large shattered glass mirrors invite visitors to gaze inwardly and reflect upon the enormity of the genocide perpetrated by Nazi Germany and the necessity for the world to always remember, lest it happen again. A few minutes from the park down Vesperstraat is a tall building alongside a wide canal. It is the site of a former Jewish hospital. With the roundup of Jews in full swing on March 1st, 1943, all Jewish patients were removed from the hospital and transported to concentration camps and their ultimate deaths. This is one of many convenient wholesale roundups of Jews undertaken by the Nazis. The plaque on the building reads, from this building, patients in this hospital were taken away by the enemy to their deaths. From the iron of their shackles, the state of Israel was cast. Walking back toward Waterloo Square, away from the Jewish hospital, we pass a small park with a monument which expresses the thanks of the Jewish community for the courageous help given them by their fellow Dutch citizens a memorial to so many who placed themselves in harm's way to protect their neighbors from Nazi persecution and death. Our tour ends at the Jewish Historical Museum. It is built from a former complex of synagogues which served the Ashkenazi Jews in the 17th and 18th centuries. Four shuls, the Yiddish word for synagogues, were restored and interconnected to form the present-day museum. It was formally opened in 1987 by the Queen of Holland. It contains elaborate displays of religious artifacts, art, and a powerful collection of photos, documents, and other items from World War II. The museum is one of the best of its kind and attracts visitors and scholars from all over the world. Kjap van Velsen has survived the horrors of 50 years ago, raised a family, and built a successful business career. His thoughts as a survivor may answer those who suggest that we should just forget what happened so long ago, and may also help us understand why Amsterdam is the city that remembers. <laughs>